Hi, my name is Kristen and this is Kristen Craves Books. So I'm here with another recent reads video, but this one I'm going to really narrow my focus. I've read quite a few books since my last update, but I just want to talk about the books that I read during the T. Kingfisher Readathon, which was hosted by Sarah from Brighton Bookish, because I had such a great experience. Sarah's love for T. Kingfisher really rubbed off on me this year, and I completed all the prompts for the readathon. I read five books over the course of 10 days, and I've never done a readathon that was just focused on one author, and I would definitely do that again. I thought maybe I would get tired of reading the same from the same author over the course of the week, and that kind of happened a little bit towards the end, but not in the way that I was expecting it to, so I am open to doing this again. I think Sarah said that they have some other authors in mind that they would do this for and I'm so up for that because I had a great time with this and I just liked the way that they put this whole readathon together because it was very simple. So I thought I would talk about the five books that I read by T. King Fisher over the last 10 days and I will start with my least favorite up until my new favorite T. King Fisher book of all time but just know that I enjoyed these all. I don't think that T. King Fisher really has a bad book, at least not that I have read. In the Discord, there was some discussion that maybe her, some of the books weren't up to the level that her books are now, some of her older stuff, but everybody seemed to at least enjoy everything they read over the course of the week, and that is a testament to the author. So the first one, and actually this is the first book that I read for the readathon as well, and I went with the Twisted Ones by T. King Fisher, obviously. I'm going to stop saying her name now. I think you know. This is a T. King Fisher readathon update video, so you know who I'm talking about, but... Um, if you know anything about this author, uh, you know that she writes in a range of genres and The Twisted One is one of her horror novels. So if you're not into horror, there are a few of her books that I would avoid and this is one of them. But if you do want to try her horror, I still don't think that this is the one to start with. I would highly recommend you start with What Moves the Dead, which is her 2022 release, which I listen to an audiobook. Highly recommend that experience and I absolutely adored. Everybody I've talked to loved that one. I think that is like peak horror and I just loved it. This one on the other hand, there were a lot of things that I liked about it. Um, over the course of the readathon you realize that a lot of T. King Fisher's characters have similarities and I thought that was kind of true in this one as well, but I didn't feel as connected to our main character as I have been to some of her other characters. So in this one we were following Mouse whose grandmother passes away and she had no relationship with her grandmother at all. But her father calls her and says, I can't deal with it. Can you take care of your grandma's house? And let me know if it's too bad, if we just need to bulldoze it. And I just want to get rid of it. So she decides to help her father because he never asks her for anything. And she gets there and she realizes that, is that her grandmother was a hoarder. And then she makes a room to sleep in there and things start to happen at night. And it is, there's a tension building in the first half, even though not much is happening. But then it all just comes to light and it's creepy. It goes to a very odd place that I didn't quite understand. But I think, I don't often say this, but I almost think reading the author's note of this one first is helpful. Because reading the context of what inspired T. King Fisher in writing this helped me put into perspective why all this stuff happened and what she was saying in here. And yeah, so I, it just gets really weird. If you've read this, you know. And I've a lot of people say they actually preferred the hollow places over this one but this is the one that I owned so this is the one that I went for and there is a dog in here that is pretty much the main character I would say the dog has an important role and what I really appreciated was that T. King Fisher lets you know from page one that the dog survives so the narrator is talking to you as if she's telling you her story of what happened and she says the dog is sitting beside me, his head is in my lap, yada yada. So you know that the dog makes it out alive in the end, which I know we all appreciate. So there's none of that in there. And But there are some trigger warnings in here for sure. There's like body horror, stuff with animals. Uh, yeah, it gets, gets dark. And it's all about what happens in the woods behind the house, really. There's things that happen at night. There's a room of creepy dolls. So if creepy dolls freak you out, that was freaky for me. So an okay showing. Not my favorite horror novel, not my favorite book by T. King Fisher, but I still think it's one to read once you explore her other horror. I think that What Moves the Dead first and then maybe this one. And then the next book is actually the book that I ended the readathon with, which was probably not the greatest choice because Sarah and others did warn me that this duology really is 
more of a full-length novel that they just divided into two books so that was clockwork boys and the ending is very abrupt and i haven't gotten to the second part yet because i was just kind of burnt out on t king fisher i needed to read some other things but i hope to return to it before i forget everything that happened in the first book even though not a lot happened in the first book but that's okay because i think what makes t king fisher so amazing is her character work and how quickly you can fall in love with her characters and I thought that the, actually the world in here was quite interesting but really we're just following these characters on a journey and it's a lot of them walking and on a journey and who they come across and all that stuff and that's true for a lot of her books which I normally hate I've said this so many times I hate following characters on a road trip on a journey on a quest it's just not my thing but T. King Fisher does it well it was true for me with Nettle and Bone it's true for me in Clockwork Boys as well and this is the start of like all of her series she has a few series and they're all sort of connected and i read online that this is a good one to start with so that's what i went with i think you do clockwork boys and the next book i forget what it's called now and then sword heart and then that paladin trilogy the first one being paladin grades i think that's the order you're supposed to read these in so that is what i'm going to do and i just i'm excited that she has different characters within this world that she's built because it is a really epic world really interesting and i think there's a lot of storylines that you can explore within it so i'm glad that she did that and i'm excited to get to uh, sword heart because that seems to be getting a lot of buzz so that is a high priority for me as well and i just want to read you the first paragraph of the synopsis for clockwork boys because it sums it up so perfectly even t king fisher's descriptions are hilarious and perfect and just capture the tone so it says, a paladin, an assassin, a forger, and a scholar ride out of town. It's not the start of a joke, but rather an espionage mission with the deadly serious stakes. T. King Fisher's new novel begins a tale of a murderous band of criminals and a scholar thrown together in an attempt to unravel the secret of the Clockwork Boys, mechanical soldiers from a neighboring kingdom that promise to ruin the Dowager's city. So that is what it is about. It's really the first book is a setup. Of all of that, we come into contact with the Clockwork Boys. You get great descriptions of what they look like and how menacing they are. So I thought that this first one was really a good setup. And I have to admit, I am somebody who often likes the setup of a novel a lot more than other people do. I tend to like the setup more than the conflict sometimes, and I don't know what that is about. But I like to get to know the characters better, get to know the world, and what to expect from a book. So I did really enjoy this. It was my fourth favorite book of the week but I really enjoyed it they were all stellar so this was a really really good one and I recommend it for sure now my third favorite book of the readathon was one that really surprised me because historically I do not like Beauty and the Beast retellings I say this all the time but I love I have a special place in my heart for the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast and I think a lot of readers feel the same way about that movie as I do and I recognize the problems with the relationship and all that stuff but when you read a retelling of like the original work or of the Disney version or anything, the problems with the relationship really become clear. And that is something that I found in most of the retellings that I have read. But I think that T. King Fisher was very aware of that when she wrote, wrote Bryony and Roses and kind of made the character self-aware of that. So I didn't have as many problems with it. The Beast does keep Bryony, like our Belle character, in this house with him and he has his reasons for it but he feels, feels terrible about it so you get some of that and she's not kidnapped she kind of just ends up there on her own so i thought that that was all handled really well i thought this was actually quite romantic i really liked bryony as a character she has these two sisters that i thought her we get them briefly but her interaction and relationship with them was really sweet as well bryony has a passion for gardening which is really important in here roses play a big role in this story and something I noticed about T. King Fisher is that she likes to write characters who have a passion about something which is something I love I don't care what you're passionate about if even if it's something I don't care about I hate gardening but reading about other characters who love something that much speaks to me I love it it's always fascinating for me so that's true in this book and then my favorite book of the readathon that's true for that main character as well so it's just something that T. King Fisher likes to put in her stories and something I appreciate so I thought that this book took the story of Beauty and the Beast had some great twists in it. The house itself is a character, which is something I always really love. And the magic in here is kind of interesting. The relationship is important to the story, but I don't think it's everything. It's not really at the forefront. The Beast is more of a secondary character. It's really about Bryony's story and her perspective, which I liked. Then we get some nods to Belle too and stuff and like some of the other characters that were maybe in this house and really 
the roses, as I said, are really important, like a character on their own. So I thought that T. King Fisher did some interesting things. It was a really quick read for me. I read this in a day. And of all the Beauty and the Beast retellings I've read, this is my favorite. And I might do a video, because I've read quite a few, of ranking them all and telling you my thoughts on my all the Beauty and the Beast retellings I have read. I thought that could be an interesting video to do. But right now, spoiler alert, that one's my top. Okay, my second favorite one, this is a really cute book. It's Minor Mage. and. The armadillo on this one sold me and that is why I picked this one up and the armadillo is a fantastic character and I am not surprised. Another thing T. Kingfisher does well is giving animal characters a voice and making you fall in love with these animal characters. That is true in the Twisted Ones which you don't expect in a horror. That is true in a lot of her books. So I wouldn't even say in Briny and Roses. There's a horse who we don't get a lot of but you fall in love with him instantly so it's just something that uh, Tegan Fisher likes to include that I also appreciate. So I really, it was just an eye-opening week for me and it merely made me realize what I love in T. King Fisher books. And she has a certain formula, but she does a lot of different things with it and it just works and it works for me. The humor works, all of that. So this one here is following Oliver, who is a minor mage. So his magic is very small and his familiar is an armadillo who he happens to be allergic to. So it's so sweet. And again, it's him on a journey and he meets some characters along the way and he's kind of sent out on a mission that he's not quite prepared for and he runs into some ghouls and it gets a little bit scarier than you would think. I think that this is supposed to be a children's novel but I think this would have scared me as a child. But it's one of those children's novels that adults will love because I absolutely adored it. I loved it on audiobook and another thing is T. King Fisher, all of her audiobooks have different narrators which I find interesting. Some work better for me than others but whoever narrated Minor Mage, fantastic. I loved it. Okay, and then my favorite T. King Fisher book of all time, not just in the readathon ever, it beat out Nettle and Bone, and I have a hard time believing that anything else will beat this one, and that is A Wizard Guide to Defensive Baking. And Kristen from Kristen is Fully Booked told me I would love this. She knows my taste. I was just set up to love this. So this is a book following Mona, who has a passion for baking, which I just love so much. And all she wants to do is be left alone, to her baking and making her gingerbread men and feeding her sourdough starter named Bob. She has this sourdough starter and he is like a pet. He is like a character in himself and it is the funniest thing and it doesn't seem to like anybody except for Mona and it's just so cute. It's like aggressive but also it's a sourdough starter so I just love that so much. And then she's 14 when this starts and she wakes up one morning, early morning, going to the bakery by herself to start the day and she finds a dead body and then everything starts to unravel from there. She learns that somebody is hunting people who have magic and she is forced into this position as a 14 year old girl to save everybody. And she is so resentful of this, of the adults who did nothing, of the adults who put her in this position. And I love that. She never forgives them and she holds that resentment and I love her for that. She meets some great characters along her journey and again, all she wants to do is get back to her passion, back to her old life and she's just such a great character and this book is just an accumulation of everything that I love about T. King Fisher, everything that she does well, great characterization, great side characters, great world, interesting magic, some great themes. I think this is another one that can be uh, enjoyed by all ages so I just think that this is the epitome of T. King Fisher and if you were going to read one book by her this is the one that I would recommend and then I think Nettle and Bone. So those are the two that I think are worth diving into and if you want to try your horror what moves the dead but I am running out of battery so I have to make this quick I just wanted to put this video together gush about T. King Fisher one last time it won't be the last time you'll hear about her a lot from now on from me I am sure as I continue to go through her backlist I know she has a book coming out next year as well she'll probably have a couple books that end up on my top books of the year I just adore her I appreciate Sarah for putting this wreath on together because it just made me love T. King Fisher even more. So I appreciate you watching this video. I will talk to you again soon. Bye for now.